All right, I wanted to give a brief presentation on public libraries in the United States, just in general, to give you some facts, figures, history, uh, sort of to contextualize everything that we're going to be learning about public libraries in Maryland. So there's a brief history here, um, pre-1876, and I'll talk a little bit about why that year is important in a second. But there were thousands of libraries previous to that year, though they weren't necessarily open or available to the general public, right? There were things like hospital libraries, church libraries, lots of various uh, individual libraries for specific subjects. What I want to talk about for 1876 was really the founding of the American Library Association. So this marks a distinct period in the history of public libraries. Prior to that, Benjamin Franklin uh, in the 1730s was really one of the first prominent political leaders to advocate for the development of libraries that were free. Uh, this was to provide political educational resources to members of society. Now, if we think about that phrase, members of society, uh, we can talk about the privileges that come with being able to read at a time like that right? So um, reading was really not something that was available to everybody, and certainly books were not available to everybody either. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, in the 1730s, that could be one of the, it's disputed, but that could be one of the first times that we see uh, something that is close to what we call public libraries today. Uh, lending libraries or subscription libraries, you may have paid a small fee just for access, things like that. Uh, but really, uh, there's the first library. Uh, it's contested, but we could say that it is in uh, Massachusetts. We could say that it's in New Hampshire or um, uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. So um, 1876, again, was the founding of the American Library Association. Why is this important? Well, this is uh, marking the professionalization of libraries, the organization of libraries, as well as standards for libraries. So collections, collection development, staff, uh, including other uh, aspects. Now, we also have here two definitions for what a public library is. Um, these are just two different definitions. Um, you can have your own definition. There's lots of different definitions that we could think of. But I just wanted to point these two out because I think they're um, pretty significant. Um, the first is from the IMLS and ALA. There's a link and it appears on page three in the IMLS uh, document that I'm linking to. But you can see that there are five distinct um, uh, sections to what they're calling a public library. Uh, it's an organized collection of printed or other library materials or a combination. There's a paid staff. There's an established schedule in which services of the staff are available to the public. There are facilities to support the collection staff and schedule and it's supported in whole or part with public funds. Then uh, from the ISO, um, you can see here there's another definition for what a public library is, right? And so you can see here, general library that is open to the public and that serves the whole population of a local or regional community and is usually financed in whole or in part from public funds. Uh, and then there's a further addition to that um, definition down there where I just want to highlight its basic services are free of charge or available for a subsidized fee. Now we'll talk a little bit about that, but notice that in the first definition, the word free does not appear, right? In the second definition, it does, uh, although it's um, sort of connected to or adjacent to the subsidized fee portion. So what is a public library, right? And let's talk about those uh, two definitions a little bit and contextualize here. Um, you know, you may think of a modern day public library, sort of like a picture here that I'm posting. It's got some modern, colorful furniture. It's got some spaces. You can see it's not just about books. Uh, this is a place perhaps to meet. It's got nice open windows. Hopefully there's light, right, that's coming in, as well as maybe another part of the collection or area. You can see there's some blocks off there for children. Okay, so in general, what's a public library? What are we talking about? What do we mean? Well, we're talking about stuff, right? We're talking about collections. Uh, we're talking about things that aren't necessarily just books, but definitely books. Uh, but if you think about it, there's also digital stuff now, right? And digital collections. Staff, the people, there's people that work there. 
there are library staff or librarians or administrators that are there to help out the public and to provide uh, resources and what the library has to offer to them. Place. We talk about a public library as a place or a space. Sometimes in the literature, it's referred to as a third place. What this means is uh, you, you, you have a home and you have a place of work, but what's a third place that you go to uh, frequently or to have fun or to get knowledge or to have entertainment, right? And so we could think of this as maybe a church or um, a restaurant or a bar, but also a public library fits that definition of a third place. Uh, in terms of COVID and these times, it's interesting because a lot of that place has now moved to a space, right? It's a virtual space. It's an online space. Well, public libraries can no longer convene in a physical space. Also availability, there's a certain number of hours that it's open, as well as public funding, right? So we go back to that definition or those definitions that we just talked about, and there's uh, a sense of public funding. But again, what's not mentioned here is something called free, right? Or something that uh, resources that may be free. So to enter is free, to use the bathrooms is free, but perhaps like printing out 20 pages is not free. And it comes with a small fee, right? And that's because uh, there are some services, maybe if you wanted to update that in terms of thinking about it in modern day, like a 3D printer or something that you would come, you're using physical materials that the library has purchased and is supplying. And so they need to subsidize that in some small way. So perhaps to print out five or 10 pages, it's free, but to print out an additional five, 10 or 20 pages, it costs five or 10 cents, uh, depending on if it's black or white or color, that kind of thing. You know, also faxing and other things like that. There are certain services that would come uh, with a cost. So what defines a public library? I'm going to go into a little bit of the statistics here, and you'll start to see that when uh, you compare this sort of presentation about U.S. libraries, public libraries, you can start to see some of the corollaries with Maryland public libraries. So there's um, a couple things I want to talk about here about what defines a public library. Um, and this kind of goes uh, hand in hand with some of the data and statistics that we talk about in the capstone, um, right? And that we have a presentation on there about the journey of data. This is a little misleading and I'll explain why. So in terms of the number of library systems that are out there, 5.4% um, are city, 25.9% are suburban, 24 are town and 34 are rural. Now, again, I say this is a little misleading. It kind of uh, breaks down into these are just the number of actual systems, right? So if you think about it, that 5.4 N equals 491. There are 491 systems in the U.S. that are considered urban or city. Okay. But really, it breaks down not just as 5%. 5% don't make up. Um, what uh, uh, city libraries are. It's really closer to 20. And that's because of outlets, i.e. branches and bookmobiles and things like this. So really, if you wanted to get a total count of the number, it's closer to 20, 20, 20, 40. So that's 20% are cities, 20% suburban, 20% town, and about 40% are rural. Notice that that 40% is huge. And combined with town, it's about 60%. So six and ten libraries um, are, uh, are are serving populations that are more spread out, that are in towns or rural areas. Now, also another consideration is size. Almost one in three libraries are less than twenty five hundred square feet. So again, that combined with that rural town number, it makes a lot of sense uh, because there may not be a building that's very big to house a large collection. Also, 43% are less than 5,000 square feet. So almost one in two are less than 5,000 square feet. Um, this, again, combined with the population served, about 75%, 76.4 to be exact, serve a population of fewer than 25,000 people. Again, this makes a lot of sense in context, right? You combine the, um, the towns and the rural, that makes almost uh, 60%. And um, even suburban and, and a little bit city, you could have a city that's under uh, something that's classified as a city that's under that uh, 25,000 uh, th uh, people. So uh, 
you know, almost three out of every four libraries serve a population area of fewer than 25,000 people. Now, just to sort of jump way out and just look at libraries in general across the world. This is from IFLA, which is the International Federation of Library Associations. This is not just public libraries, right? This is um, academic libraries, school libraries, community libraries, all different special libraries, every kind of library that you could think of. Worldwide, uh, we have about 2.6 million libraries. Libraries with internet access, almost 400,000. Full-time staff, so the uh, type of work that you do, how many other people in the world do it? It's about 1.6 million people. Um, almost about half of that is uh, coming from the US. Volunteers, uh, you can see here registered users, all these other numbers. It's pretty interesting, right? Uh, so in the United States, you can see down there at the bottom, it's a little bit of a cutout here. So there's about 110,450 uh, total libraries. And you can see the breakdown there of national, academic, public, school, uh, community. So right now, uh, according to IFLA, there's about 17,000 public libraries. Now that number gets a little more uh, specific when we um, look at the actual statistics. So we'll talk about that. And here we go. Public libraries by the numbers. What we're actually uh, looking at, and this is according to IMLS stats that were published in FY 2017. This is published very recently, just in the middle of 2020. They're always a few years behind in terms of collating and extracting out all the relevant material um, and, and information from statistics. So we'll go by this. Um, 9,045 uh, systems total. Now, uh, why is that number really, uh, it's a little bit different, uh, the 900 and, and 216 number, I'm sorry, the 9,216. Well, a few libraries were closed or didn't make the cut or not eligible to be called a U.S. public library. So in terms of the entirety of the U.S., there's 9,216 systems. But you can see there, um, you know, about 100 and I can't do the math, but maybe 170, whatever that number is, right? Um, couldn't Didn't make the cut. So about 98% are eligible. Um, so this breaks down to 16,735 buildings or outlets, right, individual outlets, and 619 bookmobiles to make up that total number that's over 17,000. Now, 80%, I'm going to say this again, 80% of these library systems are one building systems. In Maryland, we have 24 different ones, and we'll go over um, uh, Maryland statistics in the next presentation, but you can see here, that's astounding. Across the nation, over 80% of library systems are just one building systems. So, break down some numbers, and please, um, you know, don't get overwhelmed by these. This is really a, a comparison so that we can compare it to what the Maryland library numbers are. Again, we have 9,045 systems, about 16,735 buildings, and 619 bookmobiles. Staff, there's 142,000 full-time equivalent staff right fte stands for full-time equivalent which just means if you added up all the uh, part-timers as well so this includes the total number of people that work at public libraries i was a little off in that <laughs> that other slide sorry about that uh, for you for the u.s there's about a hundred um and forty two thousand uh that we could uh, say are full-time right and then of those how many are credential degreed librarians uh, i.e they have the mls degree it's about thirty three thousand six hundred and thirty one total holdings one point five six billion materials books seven hundred and fifteen million ebooks four hundred and sixty four million now of course uh, that number keeps on growing especially uh, due to covid and things like this downloadable audio materials it's about two hundred and sixty million uh, video of that comprises about 16 million. So how many registered users do we have uh, across the United States? There's 171 million. Now take that with uh, the U.S. population, which is close to 311 million. Um, uh, and within a library, uh, that, that are within a library area, right? So that's not the total population of the U.S., but that's how many million are within a library area. Uh, and that's coming from you know the previous year's statistics. Circulation, there's 2.2 billion items per patron checked out. I'm sorry, uh, not per patron. 2.2 uh, uh, billion items uh, that patrons checked out in general. And then there were 1.3 billion library visits. 
it's astounding to see these numbers uh, writ large for the U.S. Reference transactions, 240 million, and internet uses per year, 258 million. Uh, you can see the internet uh, computers there. There's 300,000 and close, uh, 200. And then 5.4 million programs that were offered and attended by 118.4 million attendees across the U.S. And this is an increase from the past five years, from the past 10 years, right? So this number keeps going up too. Uh, as you probably know from working in, in public libraries, we keep on offering more and more programs. This is astounding to see some of these numbers collected on one, in one place. Now, one of the uh, great things that I wanted to just point out so that you had this as a reference tool, um, there's something in the IMLS, which is the library search and compare. If you're interested, this is not required um, from this course, but just if you're interested, you can do a search and compare. You can use the search and compare tool from IMLS. Right now, it's using the FY 2018 data, but as uh, more data comes in, it will um, you know, update and go to the next year's data. And so right here, I just have an example from Maryland Cecil County Public Library. But you can compare all the libraries. So I listed all the libraries in Maryland, right? You can see up top there the filters. I have uh, State of Maryland, and we have 24. We have 24 different systems. And so you can see just at a very basic broad level uh, what the service population area is, how many central libraries, how many branches they have, um, how many bookmobiles, and things like this, OK? So it's just interesting. Now let's talk a little bit about advocacy. Um, we have a couple quotes here about public libraries. Now these numbers are a little bit off because um, this is a couple years old, but um, I'll show you a graph in a second. There are more public libraries than McDonald's in the United States, a total of 16,220. Now again, that number we just went over was a little bit updated uh, since this was a couple years old. Americans spend more than three times as much on salty snacks as they do on public libraries. Americans check out an average of more than six books a year. Um, public libraries are the number one point of online access for people without access. And 95% of public libraries provide public access to the internet. Now that number also has increased since this. So these are just some major talking points that you could use um, any day just to advocate for yourself, for public libraries, for your system. Now here's that infographic that I was talking about. Again, this is a few years old. This is from 2010, so it's 10 years or more old. Um, so there are more public libraries, 17,346. And again, that number's uh, a little bit less, it's probably about 16,000, let's say. Just ballpark it, right? A little bit over 16,000. Then McDonald's restaurants, uh, 12,275. Now that's also increased about 14,000. So it still stands, but you can see these two maps combined together, and I've uh, cited the source there. It's just amazing to see that um, there are more public libraries than there are in McDonald's. Now, it's just one of those interesting, unique facts, and again, one that you can use for advocacy if you'd like. Now let's talk about what we're doing in public libraries across the United States in terms of transforming communities and, uh, and encountering our challenging times. Um, there's a lot of community challenges in general. We could think of these broken down broadly into a few categories, things like education, things like employment or economic development, uh, civic engagement, health and wellness, access, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So if you think about education, there's literacy and there's also digital literacy. There's also media literacy. There's lots of different literacies that we teach. Uh, you may know this from signing people up for email addresses, right? That's a form of digital literacy to literally providing books that are literacy. And there's a huge focus for children and teens in terms of literacy as well. I think we all know this. There's a huge push for summer reading and summer reading programs for the youth. Um, so that's one um, you know challenge that public libraries rise up to meet, which is the education of their populace. There's also employment and economic development. So you can see a lot of workforce development. You saw this in the first part of LATI, which is the EESP. We focused on workforce. Um, there's also civic engagement, right? So making or being a place that facilitates the betterment of our uh, populace, as well as uh, health and wellness. Very important in this day and age in, in terms of COVID and, pande and the pandemic and everything that uh, has been happening for a while um, and the results and aftermath of that. All right, uh, that 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 uh, is sure to uh, have an uh, have an impression or an effect for years to come on our economics and our entire uh, situation in the country. 
Also access, we talk about digital divide, we talk about digital natives and, um, and uh, digital immigrants. And so digital inclusion is a huge part of access. Uh, having accessibility options open, so a computer that somebody who is blind can use, uh, or act, uh, resources for somebody who has um, any accessibility issues, right? Usability as well. Um, and then there's also, uh, this conversation has been going on for a long time, and I would argue that it's an undercurrent and has been an undercurrent, uh, or perhaps just a, a, a relevant piece for a long time, and it should be. But it's come into focus a lot over the past few years, which is equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And so you can see there are a lot of resources across ALA, PLA, all the different um, organizations, even MLA here in Maryland, um, that talks about equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So that is another challenge uh, in terms of transforming our communities um, that uh, public libraries deal with. Now, again, with in terms of transforming in challenging times, some of the major things that libraries have had to deal with are e-content, not only just posting and, and having it available for customers and users and patrons, but also the consumption of e-content. Uh, there's a lot more e-content that is being created and consumed in this day and age. Um, so the, keeping up with that is a challenge. There's also some market competition, right? You can think of these places as um, competition to public libraries, things like Amazon, uh, telecommunications companies, cable companies, streaming services. All of these you may not think of as competition, and that's fine, but know that economically, and, and fitting public libraries into an economic model, they can definitely be categorized as competition. There's also um, things to think about in terms of engagement. So there's social media engagement, programming engagement. Uh, outreach to the community at large is a huge issue for public libraries. And keeping those engaged is huge too. Again, thinking about and reviewing how we've done this in terms of COVID, uh, and how we've had to make that shift in public libraries is huge. We've had to turn to social media a lot more. And we don't know still whether these folks who have been accessing our services in public libraries will come back in person. That has not been made clear yet. Um, so, you know, we may need to focus more and increase our social media presences and virtual programming. Also, partnerships are very important to get out into the community and work with the community and use community spaces to form partnerships with others because uh, the library can't do it itself, right? So let's think about the future a little bit here. Uh, again, I've mentioned this, but COVID-19 challenges are huge. If we think about and you refer back to some of the statistics and outcomes that we talk about in the capstone, um, public libraries, bread and butter, are pretty much three huge indicators from statistics and data. Circulation, library visits, and programs. Um, so again, there's been a lot of um, flexibility and um, things that we've had to do in the face of COVID-19 to address these. Um, but there's also been reductions, and I'm not talking about in Maryland, but I'm talking about in general across the US. Uh, budgets may become stagnant. There may be reduced operating expenditures. There may be um, some sort of reduction in staff. We've seen that, again, across the, the United States in some aspects. Um, but these are things to be aware of uh, and that they're happening. There's also not just reductions, but there's um, a change in how uh, money is allocated, right? And so that's another way to think about um, some of these challenging times and how we want to continue to transform uh, ourselves and um, work with our communities and really provide for our communities. Another question is more or different use. Again, with social media and having to create virtual programs, uh, what does the future hold in terms of how people, customers, users, patrons are going to use the public library? Does it look like they'll be using it more? Does it look like they'll be using it differently? For example, makerspaces is a huge part now of um, a lot of public libraries and also what we teach here at LATI. So what more and different types of uses can you imagine that a library will be used for? Um, and just a note here, you know, the financial health of public libraries has been relatively stable. Uh, for the last 10 fiscal years, even almost fully recovering from the Great Recession. 
Um, so you can see here another couple numbers. But I just want to uh, say, you know, in the face of COVID-19 and, and a global health pandemic, some of these numbers might fluctuate and change. Um, but it's just interesting to think about the challenges and how public libraries will continue to meet these challenges. Thank you very much.